So hello, um, I'm Anne Makasinski and I'm 15 years old. I'm not actually British, I'm from British Columbia, so I think I'll drop the ac accent right here. So, um, some time ago, I woke up and went to wash my face in the bathroom. I looked in the mirror and screamed. Who was that? Hair tangled, drool for my dream about meeting One Direction. <laughs> Just kidding. It was worse. Uh, my head had two bug eyes on it, and I was encased in a black shell with two quivering antennae. I had turned into a beetle. <laughs> okay, I confess. I read Kafka's Metamorphosis the night before. But this story is one of my favorites because one of its themes is, a, is about the search for identity, a search that I very much identify with. Self-identity is hard for me to find and recognize because like my peers, I'm continuously influenced by others like my parents and the media. Each year, I think I have found the real me, but when I look back, I only laugh at my self-assurance. Even today, I still don't have a complete grasp on who I really am. Still, I pretend that I know who I am and what my opinions and beliefs are because I am a teenager and, you know, we know everything. In school the other day, someone called me a dilettant. I had to look up the word. It's a person who cultivates an area of interest without real commitment or knowledge. Knowledge or commitment? I thought, am I a dilettant? It's true that after I saw a documentary about pollution, I thought I was an expert at the subject. It's true that I continuously scold my dad for driving that old Volkswagen van instead of a hybrid. And it's also true that after a few attempts of Indian dancing, I am definitely an expert at that art. <sighs> Recently, I picked up a few books talking about the environment and pollution, and that's when I found out how little I really know about the environment and the commitment to save it. I thought, I really am an enviro-dilettant. So I made up the term, envirotent. It's easy to be an envirotent. It's quite reassuring, actually. The media bombards us with words like natural, green, recycled, and eco-friendly. The word green is placed on just about anything, food, plastics, everything. We are compelled to buy these products that are kinder to the environment, and it makes us feel good to do so. We believe we are doing something right. Or is it just sales talk? How much of the media and market are taking advantage of these words for their own gain? Who are we to trust? If the packaging is green, or has the word eco-friendly somehow incorporated into it, does it necessarily mean it's eco-friendly? Is it natural? It's confusing. Am I being cynical here? What about the politicians who talk the talk about the environment and the greenhouse effect? But what have they actually done themselves to reduce the carbon emissions. Recently, after talking to one of our local Green Party politicians, I saw her drive away in a hybrid. Oh, my dream car, the one that is actually good for the environment. Or so we are led to believe. Come on, a hybrid still has wheels and a frame and a gasoline engine and an electric motor and a gigantic nickel hydride battery. And what happens to that battery when it has to be replaced? A recent analysis from the National Research Council in Canada has proven that, I quote, the environmental damage stemming from hybrids and electric vehicles will be greater than that of traditional gasoline-driven cars until at least 2030. 2030? That's in more than 15 years. So is a person driving a hybrid really saving the world? Or is it just sales talk? Are they an envirotent? I think we've become too dependent on others making decisions for our own well-being. But what can a 15-year-old do about it? Well, maybe not about the car our parents drive and not on product labeling, but yes, I think we can make a difference. My story may not be the best example, but let me share it with you. My nickname is Toad. And quite appropriate, too, because as a child, I loved to devour mealworms and chocolate-covered crickets. All the attempted gifts of Barbies were shunned for being too girly and uh, not alive. 
My first toy was actually a box of transistors. <laughs> I know, my parents are a bit odd. Anyway, in grade six, I started participating in the local science fair. Most of my projects were energy related and included experimenting with Peltier tiles, piezoelectric discs, and solar cells. This year, I made a flashlight that worked solely from the heat of the human hand. I did this using Peltier tiles working on the Seebeck effect. The Seebeck effect states that if you heat one side of these Peltier tiles and cool the other, electricity will be produced. In my case, one side of the Peltier tiles is heated with the palm of one's hand and the other cooled with a hollow aluminum tube, allowing for maximum air conviction to flow through and around the tube and cool the tile even further. Unfortunately, the voltage that I got from these tiles was very, very low, and I spent weeks experimenting with voltage-boosting circuits. I thought it would never work. One evening, as I was assembling another version of my flashlight, I connected everything and put my hand around the flashlight, and it lit. First I thought, oh gee, it works! And then I thought, this is going to make a difference, a big difference someday. I had a vision of a stack of batteries a mile high just vanishing in a wink. It was at that moment that I discovered that we have the power within us to change the world, that we can actually give something to the environment, to actually be a resource, rather than one who keeps taking away the resources. I entered my project in the Regional Science Fair. It led to the Canada-wide Science Fair and as a finalist in this year's Google Science Fair. And this is what I want to share with you. We can remain listeners and followers who wait for the latest and often dubious news from the environmental and government agencies to tell us what to do and what not to do. Or we can take the initiative and turn on the light ourselves. I remember when I first posted my first flashlight video on YouTube, it got a bit over 200 views. A week later, there was over a million views, and I thought, wow, people listen to my presentation and will be thinking just a little bit differently when they, on the uses of energy. Maybe some will go on and invent even better ways to reduce our dependency on batteries. Manufacturers, where are you? I have a great product for you. My YouTube video has now reached over 1.4 million views and I continue to get much feedback from the public. Is it perhaps because I'm 15 years old? Or is it because you all feel guilty from our addiction to consumption? <laughs> but what can I do, you say? Well, what I learned is to be open-minded, but to question everything I hear and see. Appearance and reality are two different things. Learn to distinguish fact from fiction. We are young and we have new, different ways of thinking. Out of ideas? Call me up. I'll give you a few. I want to break one stereotype right now. Just because someone tinkers with science in their spare time, that does not necessarily mean that they're the smartest kids in class. They might be, and sure, that's great, but a lot of us science fair kids aren't actually those top straight-A students. We simply take advantage of our time and use it productively. I think something very special with making and playing with science is the satisfaction one gets when creating or discovering something. For me, it was when after weeks of my flashlight then not working, it lit. So let's let that light shine and let's innovate where it is needed the most. For example, get science from direct sources, not the media. Dig deeper, the good stuff is always at the bottom. Envirotant, no more. Kafka wrote, God gives the nuts, but he does not crack them. That task has been left to you and me. I'd like to think that sometime in the future, I'll wake up, look in the mirror, and sigh with relief. There she is, just a plain old toad, but a green one, and proud of it. Thank you for listening. Accents. <laughs>